Uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're now going to be talking about caring for our companion animals, critical research for improving companion animal health. And this discussion will focus on research initiatives that inform the health of companion animals, including our understanding of their risk of disease, vaccines, and medication safety and efficacy, prevention care, and zoonotic disease. We have, uh, for our talks today, we have an overview and then two more specific examples as case studies. Um, so uh, I will introduce the speakers uh, before each talk, and we'll take a couple of questions after the talk, and then have a more general discussion at the end. So to start with, we're going to hear from Dr. Dor uh, Dory Bjorn Jessen, She's a Dean of the uh, College of Veterinary, Me Veterinary Medicine at Washington State University. Prior to that, she was a professor and department chair at the School of Veterinary Medicine at the University of California, Davis. She was also the inaugural director of the Veterinary Institute for Regenerative Cures and Veterinary Clinical Regenerative Medicine Laboratory. Um, She's an accomplished educator and award-winning investigator, and we're looking forward to hearing her talk. Thank you. So it's really lovely to be here. Um, I really appreciate the invitation. It's a really lovely honor. Um, so go ahead and um, second slide, please. So I wanna state, I don't think I'll have to state it even more than once, that human and animal health are deeply connected. Uh, I, know, I know I don't have to sell that idea here. I'm not gonna talk about specific infectious diseases or zoonotic diseases, but there will be some examples I suspect after this. And I was asked to introduce and to overview. So I took a focus I, to heart the focus on data and research needs and policy and societal issues regarding the health of companion animals. My goal is to generate a few discussion items that may be of interest to the National Academies and your work to provide objective science-based advice on critical issues affecting the nation. I'm a veterinarian and a board member for the American Association of Veterinary Medical Colleges. And I really decided I couldn't start without an overview of some of the most pressing national societal issues surrounding companionable health. And then I'm gonna focus more specifically on the three targeted research areas here I mentioned. And these have been just prominent for me in my own career and perhaps some potential solutions at the very end um, of, the, of the talk that could be pursued with policy and support from an organization like the National Academies. Next slide, please. So nationally, the largest threats to companion animal health include a significant shortage of veterinarians across all sectors of professional activities and at all levels of specialization. Here, I'm just gonna to refer to the implications for companion animal health, but recognize this has huge impact for zoonotic disease surveillance and response, emergency preparedness, food supply, safety, public health, as we heard from the last session, um, wildlife health and conservation, and, and wildlife health is a huge challenge too. The overall demand for veterinary services in the U.S. has been increasing over 6% per year, but since 2007, the number of U.S. veterinarians has been increasing a rate of only 2.7% per year. Implications, uh, veterinary healthcare teams are feeling totally overworked and high burnout rate. There's markedly reduced access to care, and that means greater rates of morbidity and mortality, increased pet surrender, the shelters and other places. And the last one, I'm gonna talk a little on the next slide too, which is restricted access because um, these are near and dear to my heart, um, to underserved pet owners that have a disproportionate negative impact in historically disadvantaged communities, both near-term and long-run, and impacts the human-animal well-being um, relationship, disruption of the human-animal bond, and that's especially challenging for those who are at high risk. Of course, the other deep challenge is the cost of veterinary care. Um, in a survey a few years ago, 28% of pet owners had experienced a barrier to care in the preceding years, and that most common reason is financial. There are some proposed solutions on the horizon, most notably the Spectrum of Care Initiative, but I won't be talking about that today, but we can investigate or discuss later if you're interested. Next slide, please. So in some areas, access to care um, really mimics what we see in human medicine. High level referral clinics in urban areas, long wait lines, um, actual inability to see patients, rural areas, whether that's mixed animal, companion animal, or equine passion or equine, um, service, Native American nations, clinics that serve the pets of low-income people and the people experiencing homelessness, and inner city, um, true care deserts at this point. Next slide. 
So one solution that is taking off nationally are One Health clinics, which provide integrated health care for people and their pets. Do something here real quick. So um, people experiencing homelessness with animals, and there's a number of studies on this, place a very high value on the health and welfare of their pets. They experience barriers to traditional health services and rely deeply on their animal companions for companionship and support. Integrative health care, where we're working with physicians or nurse practitioners to provide care at the same time that we prefer, provide care for the animals. Um, medical care for humans increases if medical care for pets is provided. And the pet owner may seek care for their animal and just stay for the human health care, in spite of that was not their reason for coming. So basically, um, the human animal bond and creating these cares, um, these care centers really help with interprofessional health services, a one health approach and enhance public health, um, as well as decrease health care costs for millions of Americans and pet owners. Next slide, please. So now National Academies is all about science and research as well as policy. And I wanted to cover three areas that I thought might be of interest um, and introduce some of the topics that are gonna come next. One of the biggest challenges to harvest naturally occurring disease models for companion animal health, as opposed to for human animal health, is funding. There are very, very limited opportunities for high level public NIH kind of style funding for companion animal health issues, unless the context is in using relevant large animal models with natural occurring disease to inform human health. And I'm gonna state the obvious, but large animal models with artificially induced disease and try and mimic human disease only very indirectly impact companion animal health. So even when there is a potential relevant um, large animal model, there's often um, very little agreement about if that, if that animal is relevant or not. And even in the context of a relevant model, there's poor uptake in rodent-focused research arena um, for initiatives to propose these. And I'll talk about that more later, hence the STAR. Funding can and is also available for large and small animal health or hum from human and health care, human and animal health care pharmaceutical companies, things like Pfizer and Soetis. The challenges with this funding is it's very project-based, it's rarely ongoing, and there are always, always some academic pharmaceutical company challenges with intellectual property and publication. This is getting better on a university to university basis. Um, so I don't think that's gonna be a huge challenge. And again, I'm gonna talk about one thing here um, later as, a, as, a, as how, we, how we talk about uh, more broadly. Next slide, please. So for, public, for both public funding and pharmaceutical funding, one challenge is how do we determine if a naturally occurring companion animal disease is truly relevant for a specific human disorder? And will it provide a translational benefit to predict success in humans? Now, the National Cancer Institute at the NIH has probably done the most work on there, and they actually have a canine cancer consortium. And I realize this is slightly off topic for companion animal health exclusively, but our companion animals absolutely benefit from research on naturally occurring diseases, and this does open up options for longer term funding. So I spent about a decade working on developing and defining naturally occurring large animal models of disease for regenerative medicine approaches. I worked with physicians, research faculty, veterinarians, the FDA, among others, and a common problem was how to convince, quite frankly, first yourself and then others that what we were learning was relevant for humans and for animals. So we have a spina, dip, spina bifida approach. We used it in dogs. That led to California Institute of Regenerative Medicine or CIRM funding and Shriners Hospital funding. And it's now an approach for early intervention in fetal neonatal spina bifida. I've also provided the types of tables, just as an example, that we use in grants to support canine models. So in this case, um, we were proposing canine immune-mediated encephalitis as a model for pediatric acute multiple sclerosis. Um, and as you can see, the data that we have to drive in order to even consider these models. And uh, so this is a complicated um, thing to get, to get together. And we have hosted now the most successful feline stem cell therapy um, treatment back when I was at Davis. It's still on track to be the first FDA approved stem cell therapy in cats. And it did eventually receive some NIH funding as a model for oral immune lesions. But just for fun, I've copied the comments I received from the same R21, two different um, reviewers on strengths and weaknesses of the grant. So the top one um, was considered a strength, the same area, and then the bottom almost nearly identical comment was considered a weakness by the second reviewer. So you can read that, but the challenges have to do with 
outbred animals and not in real life situations and what that means for mechanism disease. So a common refrain. So I'll share some ideas about this at the end. Next slide, please. So one of the um, interesting challenges that I thought maybe we could be interesting for this group is how do we remove that, that what happens oftentimes when we do clinical trials um, in naturally occurring disease is the, with success, those therapies are actually removed from companion animal use. So I call this reluctant, um, regulatory reluctance barriers. And I'm gonna give you two specific examples. And I don't claim to be an expert in either. I was indirectly aware of the first due to research that was happening at UC Davis at the time I was there on feline infectious peritonitis. And I know Dr. Cole is gonna talk more about this disease later. And the second one is when I was directly involved with, again, same theme. I highly recommend the article in the Atlantic that is under um, the little kitty cat position um, picture here. It is a wonderful, fascinating story of the drug I'm gonna tell you about. First tested against Ebola, failed, but a close cousin became a groundbreaking treatment for a cat disease, but now only illegally. And that's been resurrected in the pandemic for an entirely new virus, COVID. And um, it just kind of underscores the vagaries of drug development. So next slide, please. So this is all, I'm, I'm naming the company here, it's all publicly available, and there's been a number of, a number of articles about this. But Gilead invented and prevented a drug called GS441524 a number of years ago. They co originally co-authored the study with UC Davis um, scientists, and cure rates were between 80 to 100% in both experimental and naturally occurring disease, and this is a near-fatal disease. The company won't license this drug for animal use out of fear that its similarity to the other drug, which is now approved for COVID, remdesivir, I think I'm saying that right, um, could interfere with the human drug's FDA approval process. They worry that cat research can impede the approval of their favorite drug because this drug and their favorite drug are so similar. So that the, the kind of the calling point here is any adverse effects uncovered in cats might have to be reported and investigated to guarantee safety in humans. So their caution about generating unnecessary cat data is standard industry practice. And I quote this from the article, one of the rules in drug development is never perform a test you don't have to. The results could be problematic. So now what's happening with this drug is people are paying as much as $10,000 for unlicensed um, GS441524. It's a thriving black market. Um, there's all sorts of concerns about a black market drug. Um, this is produced from any number of places and companies. It's still not approved in the United States. Um, puts veterinarians in a bind. They can't prescribe the drug or legally buy it for their cat owners. Some do agree to help owners with the injections, but they can be painful and difficult. Others want nothing to do with the unapproved drug. And a term that the AVMA highlights for this unprecedented form of what they call citizens veterinary medicine does not even currently exist in the literature. So it's a very interesting conundrum. The next slide, please. So this is an example that came out of my lab um, on canine pemphigus foliaceus. Um, again, it's the most common canine autoimmune skin disorder. There's a small molecule, a BTK inhibitor. I'm just gonna call it the BTK inhibitor that's important in B cell signaling. A company that funded the clinical trial, we published a number of the results, and I'll just read from this. In dogs with naturally occurring pemphigus, this drug treatment resulted in rapid clinical improvement demonstrated by anti-inflammatory effects visible within two weeks, and all animals proceeding to complete or substantial disease control. It's very cool results. It was then removed from the veterinary market, same reason as the previous drug, um, and eventually it was commercialized for human immune-mediated thrombocytopenia with revenue expected to reach an annual total of 154 million by 2034. Interestingly, it did fail phase three human clinical trials for pemphigus foliaceus. So this drug and its precursor drug are not approved for veterinary use. So there's two things here. The approved drug is too expensive without a third party payer system. And the veterinary market's not big enough for them being interested in actually going through the licensing for um, the approval process for veterinary. In this case, there was a first generation drug that we were allowed to continue to treat dogs at Davis with the first generation drug, which again is not now approved for human use. There's no use as it's sitting on a shelf, which was highly effective. In fact, the first publication was about the first generation drug. So one potential answer is to use different generations of drugs in the veterinary market. All right, next slide, please. 
So the final research um, idea I thought I would bring up is the need for centralized data hub for clinical trials and outcomes-based metrics for informed healthcare decisions. This is something that is very prominent in human healthcare and less so in veterinary care. So I've worked with a number of corporate veterinary practices. I'm going to show two examples here, both Mars Veterinary Health and Ethos um, Discovery. So Mars Veterinary Health is a team of 70,000 what they call veterinary associates spanning preventative, general, specialty, and emergency veterinary care. They deliver care over 3,000 clinics worldwide, and they are simply the world's largest provider of veterinary care. Recently, they formed the Mars Veterinary Health Medical Affairs Science Team, and that team is going to focus on outcomes-based healthcare and clinical studies. They want to leverage strategic partnerships, and they want to leverage data-driven insights to enhance data-informed decision-making. I recently talked with Dottie Brown about a lot of their initiatives, and it's very exciting, but there's a lot of hindrances, as you can imagine. Now, Ethos Discoveries is different. Ethos is a, is a large corporate veterinary practice, but Discovery is a slightly different. It's actually their nonprofit arm. It acts as an incubator for scientific innovations addressing unmet diagnostic and therapeutic needs, standalone, not-for-profit. And again, their hope is to improve veterinary and human health care by much the same mechanisms as um, Mars. Now, Ethos, this area is run by Sean Khanna, who used to be at the NCI and National Institutes of Health. And so he had some ideas around this, um, how to do this. Next slide, please. So just to summarize this, their goals are outcomes-based health care. This is something that's very common in human professional um, health care, very much less common in veterinary health care. How do we assess efficacy? Their goal is to build a roadmap in medical records, monitoring clinical support, benchmarking care. Both groups want to have a network of clinics that are plug and play for clinical studies, collecting the same data, same techniques, same protocols, and they want to use real world data in a meaningful way. What do they need? They need data scientists. I guess we all need data scientists, tools and platforms, a library of medical outcomes. This is actually amazingly difficult to achieve to align people in language and definitions and outcomes. But this is an area where some policy and some um, aggregation of specialists could probably really help. And my final slide. So um, these are some ideas I thought I would leave you all with um, for companion animal health. The first is to assemble a panel of experts that could divide a process by which naturally occurring disease models in dogs and cats, companion animals, could be evaluated for relevancy for specific human health disorders. It's kind of be vetted, you know, what would work, what doesn't work. How do we vet these models to open them up for both animal health and, and human health? Working with the veterinary and human FDA to understand and work through the barriers limiting the use of drugs that have demonstrated efficacy in companion animals. So this happens over and over where we use these animals, we have success in clinical trials, and then they're removed from the veterinary market. In the case of FIP, um, this is at the cost of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars for pet owners. Engaging large animal healthcare companies like Mars and Ethos to build data-informed outcomes-based health processes and practices would be very, very useful. And the final, just a personal stat at this, um, what you can do to support state and federal solutions to address the veterinary shortage, that would help us all. And with that, I will stop. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the time. Thank you. What a excellent presentation. I learned so much. <laughs> Uh, we have a number of questions for you. I'm going to ask two, and then we'll reserve the rest until uh, the end of the session. Mm -hmm. um, could you please say more about One Health Clinics, um, especially you highlighted uh, the, the homeless One Health Clinics mm -hmm. for, for, for homeless folks with their pets, mm -hmm. and how clinical care is provided, how research mm -hmm. knowledge informs such care, and how knowledge gaps are shared with the scientific community? Yeah. Well, that's lots of questions, actually, but I'll tell you just a little bit about it. So care is often provided. So at WSU, we created the One Health Toolkit. We started a kit here, and now we've started one starting in New York City and many. It's based on the premise that you need to start care delivery in places where animals are permitted. So there's a lot of barriers for people experiencing homelessness in terms of animals. So we take the care where the people are, where physicians have already started or nurse practitioners or, um, or uh, physician's assistants have already started neighborhood community care clinics. And what they've been reporting, we do this in collaboration with the University of Washington, is increases in visits up to 50 to 75 percent when you offer veterinary care at the same time. It's trauma-informed care. 
And what happens is the dogs or the cats, or usually dogs and cats, are seen first, and the human and the humans there. And then the human will be kind of taken off by a person who specializes in care of people experiencing homelessness to talk about things. We have examples, for instance, of when we need to give animals pain medications, but the owners are pain addicted or addicted to pain medications. And so working through things like toxoplasm, infectious disease. So the areas we're thinking about for research in One Health are in behavioral health. You probably are not surprised to recognize um, that there are a lot of behavioral similarities between all people and their pets, but especially with unhoused people and their pets. So behavioral addiction and the human-animal bond are the areas, and there are some areas that are publicly funded in that area that could be very useful um, for research interventions. It actually seems to me that, I mean, the 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 houseless population is uh, a, a population that is not receiving enough health care either for mm -hmm. themselves or their pets mm -hmm. generally. So it's a great mm -hmm. <clears throat> place to begin this. But I actually don't think that they are unique in the similarity of um, message, health messages that mm -hmm. they could use uh, for themselves and for their pets. And so I think that um, uh, I, one of the questions that I wanted to ask was about um, how to, you know, reinforce health messaging. Oh, I was thinking of, for example, um, food as a source of nutrition rather than as an emotional support tool. You know, people feed their pets in the same way that they perhaps feed themselves. So what, I wonder what you think about that. I, I love that idea. I love that idea. You know, um, there is so much messaging that can come out of this uh, reproductive health. So perinatal health is really important for women um, who are, you know, unhoused, have pets. Um, so one area, there is a lot of a lot of work we could do with even low income communities in this way. Um, and we have, you know, even urban care in these low income areas, um, what they call them care deserts, getting professionals together to engage in these clinics is really powerful. You know, even having rounds with students, which is something we do, we round up with the nursing students and other students to talk about what those infectious diseases are, like toxoplasma, um, you know, what's going on with um, health in terms of obesity and well-being, um, behavioral health. It's really powerful. So again, I, I've learned this expression from someone who sits on this um, on this board, but there's a platform here for care they could be really valuable for a lot of a lot of populations. I totally concur. Fantastic. We're going to save the rest of the questions until the discussion yeah. period at the end. But thank you yeah. very much. That was thank very, thank very you. great. Okay. So our next talk is from uh, Dr. Mark Mamula. He's a professor uh, in the Department of Medicine at the Yale University School of Medicine and member of the immunology program of the Yale Cancer Center. Um, he received his undergraduate degree from UCLA, um, a master's degree from Notre Dame, and a doctorate from the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. And his research interests are in cancer immunotherapies and understanding the origins and progression of autoimmune disease. So please take it away. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, and Dory, that was a terrific talk in introducing sort of topics that are near and dear to, to me as well. Uh, notably, and I think underscoring some of what your message was, was a vast underappreciation for uh, the use of spontaneous diseases, whether they're cancers or infectious diseases in both companion animals or flu, for example, as we heard earlier. And the NIH, there are too few re uh, requests for proposals from the NIH to uh, utilize these. I was going to say models. They're not models. They're real diseases, right? They're quick to fund mouse studies that are artificial. Don't get me started. I better, I won't finish here. Anyway, so uh, next slide, please. This is kind of an obvious topic I'm going to talk about. I do have a disclosure. Uh, Yale, I am not a veterinarian. I'm envious of those of you here that are. Uh, it seems like a terrific profession. I'm having more fun in the last two or three years than I've had uh, in the past 35 years here at Yale. Uh, I'm part of a company that's um, involved with studying and developing therapies for canine cancers. Uh, we are seeking USDA approval for a therapy that I'll 
talk to you more about uh, in a minute. Next slide, please. Uh, that therapy is a cancer neoantigen. I'll talk to you more about the details of that. This is a dog of my own, obviously, Photoshop that uh, passed away about 10 or 12 years ago uh, of an inoperable cancer near her heart. So I'm both a patient family as well as a provider, if you will. Next slide. Uh, this is a science, an old, it's about 12 or so years old now, a Scientific American. The entire volume was dedicated to the topic, were the topics we're talking about today and how studying the biology in companion animals can greatly inform us about human disease as well as uh, how to fix our dogs and cats that we love and that are companions. Uh, next slide. Uh, again, another New York Times Sunday Magazine article, uh, and this was, I think, about seven or so years ago, that more specifically drills down into a lot of the topics that all of us here are interested in. Um, and in particular today, uh, the dog population. There are about 65 million households with dogs. I'm sure there are more than a few of us here that have a dog or two. I'm one among them. I have two golden retrievers. Uh, there are about 90 million dogs uh, in this country alone. About one in four will, over its lifetime, get a cancer. If your dog is lucky enough to live to about 10 years old, the odds of that dog having or uh, acquiring a cancer is about one in two. So there's a clear population uh, need for good therapies for uh, our dogs with cancers. There are only about 300 or so uh, board certified veterinary oncologists in this country, which again underscores uh, I think one of Dory's topics, which was there are too few uh, veterinarians in this country. Uh, humans and dogs get, as you can see, a lot of the same virtually all of the same kinds of cancer, brain cancer, melanoma, uh, liquid cancers, lymphomas, leukemias, uh, et cetera, bone cancers. Uh, some There are some differences. Uh, in fact, dogs, the, the frequency of cancers in dogs is significantly greater than those that appear in humans. Uh, that's a long topic. Uh, that's related to genetics and how potentially uh, susceptibility genes or mutations are vertically transmitted in lines of various dog breeds. Uh, but the important thing for my comments today are the relevant biomarkers and uh, biological features of cancers that are shared between dogs and humans. And again, this would be a very long conversation if I went through all of these uh, but you can see a lot of the signaling pathways, uh, CKIT, BCR ABLE, um, PD-1 and PDL ones uh, interactions, uh, estrogen and, uh, and progesterone receptors, uh, and various oncogenes uh, lead to very, virtually identical pathways, uh, both as uh, in issues of metastases, uh, and origins of disease. Of course, humans and dogs, as you can see in the lower uh, right hand of this slide, uh, the frequency of, of cancers in humans versus dogs is significantly different. And there are a number of topics we can address regarding that. But uh, for some of the diseases, the cancers that I'm interested in, for example, uh, osteosarcoma is a is a cancer that's fairly frequent in large breed dogs, less frequent in humans, although about a thousand humans will get osteosarcoma um, in the coming uh, year. Next slide, please. Uh, there have been a lot of areas in which studies in companion animals, dogs, have led to interesting and useful uh, therapies in humans notably bone marrow transplantation, both autologous and allogeneic, uh, total body irradiation and toxicity, uh, limb sparing as surgery for uh, both canine and 
human osteosarcoma, various drug toxicity testings, and certain other specific cancer uh, therapeutics. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an example uh, of early studies in limb sparing surgery that was originally done in canine cancers and is now frequently, almost uh, is, as frequently as possible, utilized in uh, treatment of human osteosarcoma. So again, great uh, advances made uh, originally from dogs. Next slide. Uh, obviously there are cancer therapies that have transitioned from what we know in humans back to canine cancer care, various chemotherapies, which I'll uh, get into a little bit more detail, uh, various forms of radiation directed therapies. And more recently, um, checkpoint inhibitor therapies, including PDL1 and PD1s, which uh, uh, ironically, there's recently been one approved, a PD1 inhibitor uh, from Merck, uh, which has just hit the market in canine cancer care. Next slide, please. Uh, the therapies, the chemotherapies that have transitioned from <clears throat> humans to dogs include this long list. Um, although I have to say, you know, the, the treatment of dog cancers has lagged far, far behind that in humans uh, for various reasons, economics, for example, as well as uh, a number of other reasons that we can discuss here as well. Uh, I won't uh, belabor many of these. Uh, specific chemotherapies. Doxorubicin and carboplatin are among the most highly utilized chemotherapies in a variety of, of frequent dog tumors. Next slide. So one of the tumor family proteins that I'm going to discuss today are those you've probably already heard of, again, because they're frequently represented on a number of human cancers, EGFR and HER2. Uh, these are targets of a number of human cancer therapies, notably both small molecule inhibitors that interfere with signaling through these types of receptors, as well as monoclonal antibodies. You've probably heard of Herceptin and Herbitux, two monoclonal antibodies that are highly efficacious in the treatment of EGFR or HER2 positive human cancers. Um, the overall strategy, though, of what the work I will now talk about is in defining uh, a part of these proteins that we have found are immunogenic, that provoke an immune response in the host, and the host originally being mice, actually, uh, and subsequent, subsequently has uh, translated into studies we're now doing in companion animals, dogs. Next slide, please. This is the pathway that uh, we are studying. Uh, these, this receptor family is expressed as monomers on the surface of tumors. You can see that. There are various ligands that bind these surface proteins. The nature of this family is that they dimerize. They make two, two of these four proteins uh, will stick together on the surface and form a signaling complex that triggers proliferation of tumor cells, their survival, and uh, amplifies metastases. So again, the target of our therapies and many already used in human treatment of human cancers is to interfere with this process. Next slide, please. These are various human therapeutics. Uh, again, I already mentioned uh, cetuximab. This is an anti-EGFR. Uh, antibody. There are small molecule inhibit inhibitors that interfere with signaling inside of the cell. Uh, Herceptin, or also known as trastuzumab, is used in the treatment of various HER2-positive human cancers, including uh, HER2-positive breast cancers, as well as a number of others. Next slide, please. Dogs, of course, have these uh, families of proteins as well. Uh, there are three notable tumor types that we are actively studying at the moment, osteosarcoma and hemangiosarcoma, as well as transitional cell 
carcinoma. That's a tumor of the bladder, uh, often also, also called urothelial cancer. And then there are a number of other dog cancers that express these proteins, breast cancer, pituitary gliomas, lung, some forms of lung, uh, small cell, um, epithelial carcinomas, thyroid, nanal sac. So there are a large group. Uh, essentially, the tumors that don't express these are mostly the liquid tumors, uh, um, uh, lymphomas and leukemias. Next slide, please. So this re-emphasizes the similarity, at least in this family of proteins, between humans and mice and dogs. And I'm kind of cutting to the chase here. This is a region of the EGFR protein that is essentially identical between these three species, humans and mice and dogs. Uh, it's a site that we found originally in mice that was very immunogenic. It would trigger antibodies to the EGFR protein as well as cellular immune responses. There's only one amino acid difference between dogs and versus human and mice. And then the other interesting thing is that this site, this neoantigen site is also highly conserved against two other members of this protein, HER3 and HER2. All three of these are expressed in various levels uh, in different cancers, both in humans and in dogs. Next slide, please. Uh, this crystal structure is known for this family of proteins, uh, Herbitux or Cetuximab is crystallized and known where to bind on the extracellular region of this. This greatly informs us about targets. Where should we find neoantigens to target on this protein? Because we already know that other therapies like this monoclonal antibody are both efficacious and block signaling or directly kill tumors that express this protein. Next slide. So this is the overall strategy, which we continue to employ, is, is a simple immunization and boost strategy of this neoantigen, and it's in uh, an adjuvant. Uh, the middle panel is a, so a bit of a complicated immune response to this peptide, but the point is that it leads to the generation of antibodies against the EGFR and HER2 proteins that hopefully home to the tumor and interfere with the signaling process uh, on the tumor or directly kill tumors. Next slide, please. This is a group of dogs that have been immunized. You can see uh, that there are various levels of response. Virtually all dogs make at least a fourfold increase in antibody titers to this protein, some as much as 30 or 50 fold increases in titers over pre-immune serum. This is much like human responses to various vaccinations. Since we all have different major histocompatibility complex proteins, we all will um, uh, in various ways have different responses to even the same type of vaccination. This is true for all sorts of human vaccines. Next slide. Uh, the important thing here is that, uh, and again, I'm cutting and now right to the some of the conclusions is that it's been fairly successful in treating some of our dog cancers. This is one on the left, uh, Cody, who had an osteosarcoma, amputation of the affected limb of the primary tumor. The dog went on to have lung metastases, which both in dogs and in humans is the greatest source of morbidity and mortality. And after about six months or seven months uh, after vaccination with our therapy resolved, the lung met. Cody lived another three and a half years uh, and actually acquired a secondary cancer, not osteosarcoma, but a different cancer that, uh, uh, that he didn't survive. 12-month uh, survival is better than standard of care. It's nearly double. Uh, and then the antibodies we just show uh, from host dogs, bind living uh, tumor cells, the EGFR or HER2 on living tumor cells. And that's what the flow cytometry panel on the right indicates, uh, the green peaks. So it kind of does the things that human monoclonal antibodies do in, uh, in the therapeutic uh, strategies used in humans, of course. 
Next slide. Uh, the antibodies bind to the, these are now uh, osteosarcoma tissues that have been stained with immune uh, serum. Uh, EGFR is expressed on these tumor cells, and uh, which is what we're showing here, positive control at the, at the bottom. So the green fluorescence illustrates uh, immune serum versus pre-immune serum binding specifically to the tumor cells. Next slide. We now have an active collaboration with Merck. Uh, again, I mentioned they recently came out with a monoclonal antibody that's been developed exclusively for canine use. It's approved for um, mast cell tumors and melanoma in dogs. We are studying it in hemangiosarcomas along with as a companion uh, therapy with our own neoantigen therapy, and that's just underway. So uh, we're anxious to see uh, how it's working. Again, much like human cancers, the strategy is in defining what combination therapies, uh, in particular checkpoint inhibitor therapies, along with chemotherapies or possibly radiation, lead to the best outcomes. This has been done in humans for years, decades and is now being appreciated as new therapies become available for the treatment of canine cancers. Next slide, please. Uh, again, this is more fun than I could have imagined. Uh, I get great emails and stuff about dogs that are doing well. Uh, I get uh, notes from elderly people who have lost their spouses and their companion animals, their dogs are either companions or in some cases, service animals, and now they have cancer and are uh, and know how uh, difficult it is to treat dogs with cancer. So uh, again, this this helps me sleep at night. Um, next slide, please. And again, this is to rem remind me, which I've already mentioned, is that uh, while we may not be a standalone therapy, at least yet although we are certainly investigating that, is that we're actively investigating things like radiation therapy along with our own neoantigen therapy and various uh, conventional chemotherapies, again, in spontaneous canine cancers. And with that, I think I just have an acknowledgement slide. There are a lot of people that help here. Uh, the Canine Cancer Alliance has been gracious enough to help support uh, our studies. It's been a little bit tough here at Yale doing these. Uh, they're focused, obviously, on treatment of human cancers. We don't have a vet school here. So it's been paddling upstream in many ways for me, but it's been a fun project. And these are my folks at the bottom. have to acknowledge them for keeping me interested in this topic. Happy to answer questions. Thank you, Mark. That was fantastic. I learned so much. Um, I want to start by asking um, what yes. limits chemotherapy development um, for dogs other than economics? Uh, you, you mentioned briefly uh, that there were there were other big issues, but economics seems to rule the day. So what are the other issues? Uh, I think availability. I mean, certainly some of the newly, well, it was a bit addressed in, in Dory's talk, right? I mean, some of the drug companies don't necessarily want to see adverse events that may show up in dogs. And those would be potentially the newer therapies that are arising. Uh, and then just availability and cost. Economics is a big driver in how families treat their dogs with cancer. Obviously the big difference is as humans, if you go into a clinic with your personal cancer, you're not dictating your own cancer care, right? It's being designed for you. Uh, as we all know, families that take their dogs into uh, veterinary oncologists will say, oh, okay, I can afford the surgery. Uh, I can't afford the chemotherapy or vice versa, or, you know, what can we do? Um, you know, it's, it's largely, I hate to say it, uninformed, family people that don't um, always pay attention to the best advice given to them about treating 
this is one of the hardest things that I have to deal with is that families just saying, oh, I just want to come in for the vaccine, you know, or the neoantigen and, you know, don't really care about understanding the mechanisms or contributing to your research, Dr. Mamula, et cetera. Yeah, uh, great point. So that leads me right into my next question, which, um, so yeah, Dory talked about medicines not being available uh, in the veterinary world anymore because of um, perceived conflicts by the companies, development companies with um, human medicines they want to bring to market. Um, but you mentioned therapies that are available for um, veterinary use. So are, can you help us understand a little bit better what the primary reasons are for some therapies being removed from veterinary use, which we got a little bit of understanding about that. Um, but then how are other therapies that, that are being developed um, that are, you know, there's a joint therapy being developed for human use. How are those available for veterinary care? What's the difference there? It, it's becoming, uh, I, I think it's improving um, in that there are now companies out there that actually will take tumor samples from dogs and do genetic and mutation analysis and suggest uh, even human therapeutics that can, if they've been, uh, if generics are available or off-label use, uh, and will suggest appropriate chemotherapies based on you know, the genetics and the mutations of an individualized canine cancer. Uh, again, will they find widespread use? And again, it speaks to the economics. You know, our human insurance companies will often or most often pay for those types of studies. Uh, these are all out-of-pocket expenses in the veterinary world. But again, all the vets here can speak probably much better to those topics. All right, thank you. Um, we'll save the rest of the questions till the end, so please stick around for that. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Dr. Emil Cole, who is an associate professor and chief of clinical pathology at the Veter Veterinary Medical Teaching Hospital um, at the University of California, Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. He's also the chair of the board of directors of the North American Veterinary Regenerative Medicine Association. He's a graduate of the correct School of Veterinary Medicine in Israel and completed residency at UC Davis with, uh, uh, and earned his PhD with, um, with Dr. Borgesson. His research fo focuses on comparative stem cell biology and its application to regenerative medicine and disease modeling. So take it away. Well, thank you very much for this nice introduction and for the opportunity to come and talk to you. It's been really interesting so far, and it's also been a while since I've seen Dory. So it's great to see you, Dory. It wasn't planned. Um, so today, uh, so after we heard those two great talks from Dory and Mark about kind of overview about the you know uh, naturally occurring diseases in animals and kind of thinking, uh, kind of big picture, I'll take you down. Uh, and tell you about one case study, uh, me studying uh, feline infectious peritonitis, FIP. Oh, next slide, please. So FIP is an enteric uh, feline coronavirus. Uh, I won't go into too much detail, but what I have here to the right, you have here the kind of a prototypical lesion, pathological lesions of FIP, the characteristics, which you can see that kind of um, fluid accumulation in the abdominal cavity, what we call wet FIP, this kind of viscous yellow fluid. And then you can see it below that, you can see a kidney with pyogranulomatous inflammation, which manifests not only in the kidney, but throughout the body. And you can see here also a brain. The pathogenesis of FIP is really, really interesting, actually. Uh, I won't, again, won't go into too much details, but this Feline coronavirus, which is very common and oftentimes subclinical in cats, for some reason in some cats, mutates into FIP virus. Once it mutates into FIP virus, it goes beyond the GI tract and infects the cat systemically. It happens primarily in kittens, but not only. And the cat and the disease is characterized by fever, multi-organ involvement with pyogranulomatous vasculitis, and is often fatal. 
And you've heard a lot about the GS drug. Uh, Dory talked about that. So I won't, uh, I won't go into that. Next slide, please. So while the GS drug is really uh, effective in treating, especially with FIP, but also the dry form of the disease, uh, we still don't know really a lot about the long-term uh, consequences of those cats that are being cured from FIP. And there is one paper that is published, and we have definitely seen that also in our cohorts, that cats that were cured, so-called, from FIP using the GS drug, while we can find the virus, even if we look, you know, by PCR, various you know, histochemical stainings, we can't find any viral genes or viral proteins nowhere in the body. Those, uh, the lymph nodes and spleens of those cats are oftentimes still enlarged and have reactive uh, lymphoid hyperplasia, suggesting that they have ongoing immune antigenic stimulation and that their immune system is not back into balance. And maybe I should have emphasized the fact that that virus uh, actually directly attacks those lymphoid, uh, those lymph nodes, uh, and causing severe of severe lymphopenia is one of the kind of the hallmark of that disease and lymphoid depletion. Next slide, please. So, kind of the current knowledge gaps that we have with that disease that I'm interested in is, first of all, in regards to disease pathogenesis. In spite of everything that we know, it would be surprising enough to realize that we don't even really know the cellular tropism. So if you look at the literature, it's oftentimes cited that uh, macrophages and histiocytic type cells are infected, but the level of evidence is, I would say, not very strong. And I'll share at the end of my talk some evidence to suggest that maybe there is a uh, different cellular tropism or additional cellular tropism that wasn't yet recognized. We also, we don't know what's the mode of cellular entry. Uh, it's assumed to be um, receptor like many other, uh, like many other coronaviruses, but we don't know what's the, what is the receptor and what's the mode of entry. What I'm more interested in that actually, because I'm not a virologist, I'm more interested in the immunopathogenesis. Specifically, I'm interested in the mechanism of lymphocyte loss and depletion because this is a hallmark of this disease and it's really common in several other important diseases, uh, especially chronic, uh, chronic viral infection. The potential role of T cell exhaustion. So, and again, I won't go into the details of T cell exhaustion and Mark kind of touched base on PD-1, pd one uh, These are uh, T cell exhaustion is a dysfunctional T cell state that that happens as a result of chronic antigenic stimulation. And in essence, it kind of allows the host to leave uh, with this chronic antigenic stimulation and not causing too much collateral damage. Nonetheless, if we want to resolve whatever is causing this antigenic stimulation, that being cancer or chronic uh, viral infection, we have to resolve that T cell exhaustion and rejuvenate those T cells. So I have great interest in that. And the other thing is something that was cited again and again for FIP with, again, kind of more of a limited evidence is systemic inflammation and more than that, cytokine, cytokine storm. Um, from a therapeutic perspective, you know that the GS is not commercially available in the US. Uh, we don't know what are the long, uh, long treatment, uh, uh, what are the consequences of longer term follow-up and Again, the thing that I'm more interested in is lymphoid tissue recovery and regeneration after treatment. What can we do to facilitate that? Next, please. I want to talk here really briefly about a disease that, uh, a human disease that has multiple similarities with FIP. I'm not suggesting that it is FIP or, but it has multiple similarities. That's, and that's a, syndrome that is caused by uh, SARS-CoV-2 in children, and it's called a multisystemic inflammatory syndrome in children, or MISC, which is a rare syndrome that attacks uh, presumably healthy, ch uh, health healthy children and is causing a life-endangering um, life disease, a uh, life-endangering disease. Uh, it also, as the name implies, it, it attacks, it affects multiple organs, and it's a highly inflammatory disease. So, you know, the fact that 
FIP and MIC have some similarity, that's really the reason that allowed me to do the study that I'll be telling you about, because my that study has been funded by uh, NIH. And the way that I was able to do that was to convince them that we could learn something not only about FIP, but also about MISC. Next, please. And maybe we can go directly to the next slide. Yep. So here I'll give you just a brief intro to MSC biology mesenchymal stromal cell. And mesenchymal stromal cells have been around for decades now. And we know a lot about those cells uh, and how to treat and how to use them therapeutically. And people are really interested in the way that we can use those cells, harness those cells in order to modulate the immune system. Because those cells, they really communicate with really any immune cell that you can think of. And there are lots of studies, both in vitro and in vivo, about those cells. That being said, most uh, clinical trials and studies are in the context of hyperinflammatory diseases where the MSCs are being used in order to dampen inflammatory response. Next slide, please. In previous studies that we've done with a collaborator at the medical school, looking at the SIV model of AIDS in uh, rhesus macaques, we've noticed something very interesting. So we wanted to treat those uh, monkeys with MSCs uh, for, uh, in order to decrease or dampen the inflammatory response that we see in HIV patients. But we've learned a lot of really interesting things. And a couple of things that I'm highlighting here is A, that the CD4 T cell number really increased with treatment. And that uh, also, if you go to the next slide, we saw a decrease in viral load to your left, just with MSC treatment, no antiviral on boards. And we saw an increase in CD8 T cell function. So, that kind of made me want to go back and see if I, I can apply that to our veterinary patients, right? And that's where FIP kind of comes back. So next slide, please. So then my hypothesis for the project that I'm going to tell you about right now is that a combined GS MSC therapy in cats with FIP is safe, synergistically restores injured lymphoid tissues, decrease systemic inflammation and enhances specific anti-coronavirus immunity, again, in cats with FIP. And I have to say that I couldn't have done this project without Brian Murphy to the left, who's our pathologist and virologist, and to the right, uh, Crystal Reagan. Uh, she's our internal medicine specialist, and she's the one that sees all of those FIP uh, patients on at the VMTH. Next slide, please. So this is an outline of our veterinary clinical trial. We basically, we enroll cats that we diagnose with, uh, with FIP. We initially, as we enroll them, we start the GS treatment. And then a week later, we either treat them with uh, IV infusion of MSCs or a placebo control. Two weeks later, we give them another infusion. And then we keep on following them for another 10 weeks. And during those 10 weeks, we collect blood, we collect diffusion, and at the time of enrollment and at the end of the study, we collected an aspirate of their mesenteric lymph node as a critical site for both infection, but also where uh, immune response is being created. Next slide, please. So this is our patient demographic, and really, it's just kind of a disclaimer. Unfortunately, we didn't have any female cats we really wanted, but uh, we've been. it took us longer time than I appreciated to enroll those cats, so we only have one female in this cohort. Next, please. One of the best good news that came out of the study is that was safe. So we were definitely, we had some concerns with IV MSC treatment in those hyperinflammatory cats as one of the reported adverse effects of uh, MSC, both in cats and in humans, is uh, creation of thrombosis, and especially in a disease that is prothrombotic and hyperinflammatory. So the good news is that we didn't see any significant adverse effects in our MSC cats. Next, please. And I'll start and I'll share some data and I'm happy to go later into details, but I'll go kind of superficially. And the goal is just to show you the level of science that we were able to do due to the fact that we got, you know, more significant federal funding to enabling this. So 
we collected initially, we collected some, uh, you know, some clinical data that throughout the weeks and really what, and we also followed FIP viral loads. And again, not unexpectedly, as soon as a week after treatment, FIP virus was no longer detectable in the effusion. So those cats were either dry, so-called, so they didn't have any effusion left or that they had tiny bit of effusion, but there was no viral, uh, uh, viral detected by PCR. Next, please. So we also measured uh, in three different time points, uh, we measured serum cytokines. We ran a battery of 19 serum cytokines and we compared that. You can see the gray bars to the left are control healthy SPF cats. So this is really one of the first times that we were able to document that cytokine storm. And you can see that those cats have sometimes pro-inflammatory cytokines that are really up the wazoo if to be really professional, right? They have really high cytokine levels. You can see their interferon gamma, IL-12, and various other ones uh, that are markedly elevated. And I can also tell you that there is a huge variation between cat to cat. There were cats that were super inflammatory, and then there were cats that were significantly less. The one cytokine that came out to be really interesting in my mind was PDGF beta where you can see that upon presentation, those cats have really basically no PDGF beta, measurable PDGF beta, very much like the control cats. But once they're being treated, their PDGF beta goes up. Um, and that's really interesting to me, potentially moving forward as a looking at PDGF beta as a prognostic uh, factor indicating a response to treatment. And next slide, when we correlated, oh, so first of all, I'll tell you about the hematology. So the thing that was interesting about the hematology is, you know, we were able to, you know, document that those cats do present with lymphopenia. So that was a hallmark of MISC, that lymphopenia, those and cats present also, they recapitulate that lymphopenia. With treatment, lymphocytes go back to normal. And the interesting thing is that, you know, in spite of the fact that our study was uh, not super powerful. So we had five cats in the MSC group and five cats in the placebo. It seemed like the cats that were receiving MSC, their lymphocyte count were kind of getting more normalized as opposed to the cats that received just the GS drug. They were constantly going up. And at the end of the study, you know, three of them had lymphocyte count that were above reference intervals. And uh, two of the other ones were kind of also at the upper end. Next level, next slide, please. When we correlated cytokines with cytokine data with uh, the hematologic data, PTGF beta was again interesting. So, you know, other than the fact that, you know, those pro inflammatory cytokines, they correlate with uh, hematologic variables of inflammation, PTGF beta was the only one that positively correlated with lymphocyte count. So, again, Disease being, you know, having lymphopenia as a hallmark and PGGF beta increases with treatment and it also correlates with increasing in lymphocyte count. So kind of an interesting thing to look into in the future. Next slide, please. So the rest of the data that I'll show you is derived from the mesenteric lymph node aspirin, which was to me really incredible. The fact that we could even, so our radiologists were able to take those patients, right? These are not you know, disease animal models, these are patients, they were able to get lymph node aspirates from those tiny cats using ultrasound. And we were able to fix those cells and get them uh, into single cell RNA-seq. So we got in total about 50,000 uh, good quality cells. And this is basically what the map kind of looks like. And then if you start looking a little bit deeper, let's go to the next one. Next slide, please. Yeah, so we had three, uh, sorry, four kind of major populations. So we had, you know, it's a lymph node. So we had lots of B cells. We had a few plasma cells in purple. We had our T cells and we had the myeloid, which are mostly kind of histocytes and macrophages. Um, next slide. But I was really interested in that light blue cluster where you can see on top because that light blue uh, uh, cluster is a T cell cluster. And when I looked at the differentially expressed genes within that cluster, many of them were uh, associated with viral infection and uh, more importantly, with uh, pathways, uh, cellular pathways that are associated with uh, T cell exhaustion. 
such as the pd one expression and PD-1 checkpoint pathway in cancer. So when I looked within this uh, cluster and looked for specific kind of hallmark uh, markers of uh, exhaustion, such as CTLA-4, TG, PD-1, uh, and talks, sure enough, they were highly expressed there. So this is really the first time that we're seeing evidence of T cell exhaustion within uh, within this disease, uh, FIP, and CD274, which is PDL1, was also expressed, but not within this cluster, but mostly in the histiocytic cells. And so that was really interesting to me. So now, please, let's move to the next slide. So we are, uh, we've also looked at that by flow cytometry, looking at CD8 and CD4 T cell function and their ability to secrete uh, multiple cytokines, so polyfunctionality, another kind of feature, functional feature of toxicity. And, you know, our data wasn't statistically significant because we had low numbers and the data was quite variable, but you can see to the left that both the CD8 and the CD8 uh, and the CD4 had lower frequencies of cells that were double positive for both TNF and IL-2. Again, supporting kind of a concept that those cells are uh, exhausted. And this is peripheral blood and not the lymph node itself. Next slide, please. So now what we're doing, we have validated uh, antibodies that we can further apply in tissue sections that we have from diseased animals. Uh, and we're going to look at CTLA-4, CD3, and if you'll go to the next slide, we can also look at PD-1. We found antibodies that cross-react with cats, and we are uh, in the process of uh, staining uh, those lymph nodes and quantifying uh, those PD-1, CTLA-4 positive T cells. Next, please. And then the other thing that I want to show you in the single cell RNA uh, seq data was something that to me was very interesting. When I looked at the T cells and compared the T cells at presentation and when they were exiting the study, one of the things that really was uh, noticeable among the uh, differentially expressed uh, upregulated pathway was necroptosis. So as I said, um, uh, lymphopenia and lymphodepletion is a hallmark of both FIP and MISC. But throughout the years, apoptosis was kind of cited again and again as the cause of that lymphodepletion. And it may be that we have a completely different pathway that is uh, driving that lymphodepletion, which has, you know, consequence. Necroptosis is a highly inflammatory pathway and that could be a potential uh, target of therapy. So very interesting to me and definitely something that I'll be looking into in the future. And finally, let's go to the next slide, please. So finally, you know, we talked initially about the uh, cellular tropism. So I just want, that's going to be just a teaser here. So when I looked at uh, the data, we were able also to look at the uh, viral transcript. And when I looked at the distribution of those viral transcripts, sure enough, most of them you can see in this fish-like cluster to the right. And these are, as uh, I'll remind you, these are the macrophages and hexocytes, and that's where you'd expect to see them. That's where, you know, again and again, it's you look at the literature and it says that FIP virus infects macrophages. But you can see that there are actually quite a few of them that show up within the T cell cluster and even the B cell cluster. So we are now in the process of looking at that through multiple other angles as well. We'll be doing some uh, immuno, uh, multicolor immuno staining uh, and, um, and EM studies to see whether we can actually, we can really prove that FIP virus infects other cell types and not just uh, histiocytic cells. Next one, I think that we're getting close to the end. So if to summary uh, findings, all of our patients completed the study. We didn't have any significant adverse effect. Uh, abdominal effusion, viral load, and lymphopenia resolved within seven to, uh, to 14 days. Uh, we saw uh, that cytokine storm upon presentation that subsided. And PDGF beta uh, kind of presents itself a really interesting and unexpected cytokine that, potential, that goes up with treatment and potentially could be a marker uh, for response to treatment. And then I told you about the T cell exhaustion, which is uh, 
to me is exciting because A, it's a target for therapy, but also it allows me to keep on working with cats with FIP as T cell exhaustion is a mechanism that is relevant to many other diseases, including human diseases, right? And then we talked about necroplosis as a potential new pathway to explain lymphopenia and FIP virus cellotropism. So that's it. Next slide, I have to say thank you to a lot of people that uh, made this study happen. Uh, obviously, it was funded, as I mentioned, by uh, by the NIH, uh, but also I received some funding from uh, um, the CCH, the Center for Companion Animal Health, and gotten a lot of help from our Veterinary Center for Clinical Trials, uh, the laboratory from the Veterinary Institute for Generative Cures, people in my lab, um, people at the VMTH. It really required a village. So thank you all. Thank you, Amir, for that deep dive into FIP. Uh, uh, we have some questions for you, and I wonder um, if we can bring back the other panelists too as I'm asking these questions. So to start with, excuse me, sorry. So I'm gonna ask a couple of questions here. Um, uh, are there natural immune responses in cats that more effectively address uh, FIP, and if so, are the same mechanisms present in humans? So untreated, FIP is uh, a lethal disease, and there are rare uh, survivors of that. And it's usually uh, kind of the, the dogma is we definitely see really high concentration of immunoglobulins, and it's thought that it's, you know, this is part of the immunopathogenesis that the body mounts a really robust humoral response and not cellular response that, that would be more effective. Um, and the question was, how does that, so can you repeat the, the second part of the question? Yeah, so, so um, right, so if, if cats have uh, an immune system that is more effective at addressing this virus than, um, than I guess than humans and um, but if so, are these same mechanisms present in humans perhaps that are are less effective, but we might be able to use uh, enhance that somehow? Yeah, MISC. So you know, I pitched that as a model for MISC, but I don't think that it's the only model that is relevant. Uh, and in MISC, initially they thought that because that disease manifests like two to three weeks after the kid already kind of recovered from COVID, they thought that it's um, really a disease that is almost unrelated to viral stimulation directly. Uh, though there are a few auto autopsy studies that definitely show the presence of viral antigen within tissues. Um, so this is still, a, obviously it's a really new disease and uh, the pathogenesis is still being uh, studied. So I'm not exactly sure how to answer that question. Okay, no problem. Um, another question is different companion animals have different immunological phenotypes. Cats might be quote unquote better at inflammation. How does a cat's immune state present um, T cell exhaustion, and given their steady state, might there be hyperinflammation with PD1 block? I, th I think that that's a great, I mean, that's a great question. We don't know a lot about that, definitely not in cats. In dogs, there have been by now a few studies in the context of cancer looking at PD1 blockage. Uh, and in cats, we just, we don't know that. And there is, there was, uh, so there is, I think, some data about PD-1 blockage in dogs. But again, the concept of exhaustion, uh, because of the lack of antibodies and oftentimes resources for veterinary medicine, I don't, we don't really have, uh, we're kind of lagging behind when it comes to, especially this specific uh, immunological concept, the T-cell exhaustion. Um, so, you know, I, personally, I don't think that by treating cats, for example, if we'll target the exhaustion pathway, uh, will we see hyperinflammatory? Uh, I suspect not. Again, I think that you know the treatment has to be coupled with an antiviral treatment. But in order for uh, the therapy to be successful, you have to harness the immune system. And as long as the immune system is crippled by exhaustion, 
uh, it's less likely to be affected. Uh, but we need to put it to trial and test that. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm sorry, I got a little confused earlier, but we have um, one more speaker. Um, and uh, so we're next, we're going <clears> to <throat> hear from uh, Dr. Stephen Frydenberg on um, insights from a decade of studying autoimmune diseases in um, dogs. And um, so take it away, please. Great. Uh, hey, thanks, Mariah. Am I able to have control of my slides or? Oh, perfect. Uh, click to start the remote control of the shared screen. OK, uh, let's see. Doesn't look like it's working or advancing. Let me just see if I can get this. Yeah, it doesn't look like. Oh, here we go. Well, oh. yes. OK, cool. Now it's working. So thank you guys for having me here. Um, this afternoon to talk about my research in autoimmune diseases. Just to introduce myself, um, I'm a veterinarian and a geneticist at the University of Minnesota, and I'm also board certified in emergency and critical care medicine for dogs and cats. So I kind of come at studying autoimmune disease from both a clinician's perspective who actually sees these patients in the clinic, in the emergency room, and in the intensive care unit, but then also more from the perspective of a geneticist. And that's kind of how I'm going to talk to you guys today about um, autoimmune diseases. So a lot of these themes that I'm going to talk about today are, are things that I think fit really nicely, especially with some of the, the stuff that uh, Dory's talked about or earlier in terms of availability of resources and things like that for veterinary studies. So why do I study autoimmune disease in the dog? Why do I think it's important? So first, I think when you just look at companion animal health, um, autoimmune diseases are really common and times, oftentimes severe medical problems that we see in our patients. They affect all body systems and organs and are, are highly, highly similar to human diseases, um, which is really another great reason to study them. So many times I think conditions that we see in veterinary medicine um, are mimic the same ones that we see in humans. And sometimes, particularly for the diseases that I study, they occur at a much, much higher frequency in certain dog breeds than they do in humans. And so offer us a great opportunity to study these diseases, to really investigate their pathogenesis in a way that really might not be possible to do in some of these more rare human diseases. And I think kind of in line with, you know, everything we heard about wildlife medicine and other approaches to thinking about veterinary medicine, you know, I think understanding them in dogs really does support a one health approach to medicine in terms of what we can learn from animals benefiting humans um, and vice versa. Um, another really great reason, and I think a lot of this has come kind of come forth primarily from the cancer world, but many of these autoimmune diseases that we see in dogs, I shouldn't say many, but really all of them are, are spontaneous diseases. So dogs live in the same environment we live in, they're exposed to the same environmental toxins, exposures, backgrounds. And so um, because they occur spontaneously in animals that have but some more genetic diversity than the mouse models that I think autoimmune diseases are commonly studied in that also makes dogs a great model for, for studying autoimmune diseases and that they're not like a laboratory induced model that may or may not mimic something naturally, but there's something really that occur just by, 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 by virtue of dogs um, living in the same world that we live in. And I think one of the things I'm going to try to kind of talk to you about or convince you maybe is that, you know, dogs really do provide an advantageous genetic model to try to get at some of the genetic underpinnings of autoimmune diseases in a way that kind of make it a, a little bit harder to study these diseases in people. And so when I think about um, dogs as a genetic model for studying diseases, I, I always like to sort of put up this slide here, or this figure on the left. And, and this comes from a paper that was written back in 2008 by probably some of the most well-known dog geneticists, Charleston Blateau and Eleanor Carlson at the Broad and the University of Massachusetts. And this just sort of shows you a little bit about how dogs developed as, as a species. So you, you, may, you may not be aware, but dogs you know, diverged from the wolf back at about 15 to 30,000 years ago, where dogs were bred or sort of started to hang out around humans and sort of exhibited all these traits that made them friendlier and, and more interested in humans, less afraid. Um, but it really wasn't until I would say the past couple of hundred years where, where humans really started to exert an in, in, in inordinate influence on the way that dogs looked, 
shape, with their shape, their behavior. Um, and we call these as geneticists, these recent bottlenecks that took place in the development of dog breeds. And these recent bottlenecks really, like, as I mentioned, they, they've occurred hundreds, really not thousands of years ago. And they're entirely driven by humans. And the term that we use in veterinary, in genetics is that they're this intense artificial selection to make dogs look and behave and act in a certain way. So for example, the pug that you have, you love, you know, may have a smushed face, it has a curly tail, a standard poodle has curly fur, a German shepherd has pointy ears and is big and has straight fur. All of those things exist because we as humans designed these dogs to look a particular way. And so what this means from a genetic perspective is that dog breeds within a breed, there's very, very limited genetic diversity within a breed. So, you know, every every standard poodle, for example, which is a breed that I study, is probably about 70 or 80 percent the same as every other standard poodle that you really might see. And this limited genetic diversity, what it leads to is it leads to certain diseases becoming highly, highly overrepresented within a breed. So for me, as someone who's interested in autoimmune diseases, for me as a geneticist, a lot of the way we think about all of these diseases is how do they occur within a breed and how can we study them within a breed to understand what's going on because, because of this limited genetic diversity, diseases oftentimes become highly, highly overrepresented. And so I'm here as to talk a little bit about autoimmune and immune mediated diseases. And this is just an example to show you of what this effect of inbreeding has led when it comes to the development of autoimmune diseases in dogs. So these are just four random dog breeds that I thought of as I was putting this slide together. But you can take a look in the upper left. That's a picture of a standard poodle. They are highly, highly overrepresented for Addison's disease. So standard poodles develop Addison's disease, which is an autoimmune disease affecting the adrenal gland probably about 20 fold more common than an average dog breed. They also develop a disease called sebaceous adenitis, which is an inflammation of the oil producing glands of the skin. Below that, you see cocker spaniels. They develop a disease called autoimmune hemolytic anemia, immune mediated thrombocytopenia, dry eye, also called ker keratoconjunctivitis sicca. And you see other autoimmune diseases in the miniature schnauzer, highly overrepresented for diabetes, also non autoimmune diseases like hyperlipidemia. And German shepherds are oftentimes thought of as like a trove of auto, having a trove of autoimmune diseases ranging from exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, perianal fistulas, chronic superficial keratitis, kind of the list could go on and on. And, and these are just kind of some examples of how autoimmune diseases congregate in breeds. That's largely a result of the inbreeding and the effects that humans have placed on the, the different breeds that, that we've created through artificial selection. And so when I think about the formation, you know, again, I, I sort of come at this perspective from the perspective, of, come of these diseases from the perspective of a, of a geneticist. I, I really, the way I like to sort of describe genetic diseases and the way that we sort of see them in dogs is really in terms of three different types of diseases. So we see Mendelian diseases in dogs, we see polygenic diseases in dogs. And the other thing, which I think is maybe a little bit different from um, the, the way that we think about genetics in humans is I think because of the way that we've created dog breeds, to some extent, some of the genetic diseases and the autoimmune diseases we see are probably fixed or the predisposition to developing diseases is probably fixed within the breed. So the, the first kind of diseases, Mendelian diseases, these are diseases that have kind of occurred. Uh, they're probably the most well-studied diseases in, in veterinary medicine, where you have, for example, like a popular sire, that sire could have a genetic disease that may not manifest till later in life. That sire semen can then be used for thousands and thousands of breedings and can easily po propagate a disease within a breed. Most of these diseases that, that, it, that it happen through these popular sire effects or through bottleneck effects are Mendelian, so single point mutations. And probably about 500 different Mendelian diseases in dogs have been described. They've been associated with single point variants. And I think they're really much of the low hanging fruit that we think of when we think about diseases and genetics more broadly in, in veterinary medicine. So the diseases that I study, which are autoimmune diseases, unfortunately have really very, very little to be associated with Mendelian diseases. I can't actually think of a great example of an autoimmune disease or many great examples that are truly Mendelian. 
And so really, I think where a, a lot of the focus of veterinary genetics and autoimmune disease study in particular, from a genetics perspective in veterinary medicine is focusing on polygenic diseases. And polygenic diseases happen in veterinary medicine when you have kind of these common alleles, right? So common variants that we might see across the dog population where you get combinations of these common alleles that can occur in uncommon combinations. And there's not many autoimmune diseases in dogs that have been well mapped, but a great example that I can think of would be an example called dermatomyositis, which is a vascular immune mediated disease affecting collies and shelties. Um, this disease has been shown to be associated with variants in three different genes that are common across the dog world, but only in collies and shelties do they combine in the right way to lead to a high predisposition of, of these diseases. And the other kind of issue as a thing in veterinary medicine and veterinary genetics that we're kind of grappling with is trying to understand a bit about this fixed disease predisposition that we think especially exists with autoimmune disease where all dogs might be predisposed, but there's some environmental trigger that would lead to the onset of the disease. And really getting at the understanding of these fixed dis disease predispositions requires kind of non-traditional genetic approaches and trying to think about functional evidence that we can use to prove that a particular variant would lead to an increased um, risk of developing a disease. So for, for me in particular, the two diseases that I focus on that I'm going to talk to you guys just very, very briefly about um, is this disease called Addison's disease. So Addison's disease is an autoimmune disorder that affects the adrenal cortex of both dogs and humans. Um, it's highly, highly overrepresented in certain dog breeds. I mentioned standard poodles. I spent a lot of my time thinking and studying standard poodles. And the other dog breed, which is even more highly overrepresented than standard poodles, would be Portuguese water dogs. And Addison's disease is the immune-mediated destruction of the outer layer of the adrenal gland, the adrenal cortex, and leads to a whole host of endocrine, endocrine problems that can oftentimes be life-threatening. Um, the other disease that I study regularly is a, a disease called autoimmune hemolytic anemia. This is a disease where the immune system attacks the red blood cells, and this disease is highly overrepresented in certain spaniel breeds. Um, and again, another sort of ri ripe area for genetics research because the disease, while it's a rare disease in humans, occurs so much more commonly um, in these spaniel breeds and gives us a great opportunity to use the tools that we have available to try to better understand the pathogenesis, not only for the benefit of dogs, but also for the benefit of humans. So kind of what are the some some high level findings that we 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 were sort of finding when we think about um Addison's disease and that's just kind of what I've focused on because we're a little bit farther ahead in thinking about the genetics of this disease. And so one of the things that we're really finding and this is a a Manhattan plot which is oftentimes a way that we look at a, a genetic data um in, in trying to map genes and understand where they're located, where variants that are associated with diseases are located across the genome. So this is uh, the result of a genome-wide association study in about 50 affected and 50 unaffected standard poodles in a highly, highly balanced population. And so when we look at this, this particular genome-wide association study, you can see we find a peak on chromosome 17 that contains a number of interesting genes that sort of separate affected from unaffected standard poodles. And so while it's great that we've sort of found this peak and we're actually actively exploring the genes and, and kind of what's going on here, this particular variation between affected and unaffected standard poodles probably expa explains about 50% of the disease risk within a breed. And so kind of what we're finding is that we need to look beyond the traditional measures of what separate affected from unaffected dogs. And what we've started to do is to look into some of this fixed disease predisposition within a breed to understand how it relates to what we find on a traditional GWAS. And that's kind of what you see here in this bottom plot. So this bottom plot shows the same 38 canine chromosomes plus the X chromosomes, and it's mapping what are called runs of homozygosity. So these are regions of the genome that are highly fixed in standard poodles. And what we can what we've found when we sort of look at 
the variants that are in these runs of homozygosity is there's a strong relationship between the genes that are fixed in standard poodles and also the genes that separate affected from unaffected standard poodles. So likely part of the pathogenesis of this disease is that you need to be sort of to, to decide which, to figure out which dog is going to develop Addison's disease, you need to probably have the variants that predispose the dogs to Addison's disease on the fixed background of what it makes a standard poodle being a standard poodle. So it's really only by understanding these fixed effects can we really put the whole picture together of how these autoimmune diseases are developing in dogs. And kind of more to come on this um, as we flesh out these findings. So because I study autoimmune disease, I'm, I'm also, even though I come at the disease from a genetics perspective, I'm also interested in more than just the genetic basis of the disease. Um, and so recently we put together an environmental risk factor survey where we looked at standard poodles and Portuguese water dogs, two breeds highly likely to get Addison's disease, enrolled about 5,000 different dogs, asked them 50 questions on trying to understand a broad range of environmental exposures. We also overlaid data from the EPA on soil qu quality, air quality, water quality. And while we kind of entered this study trying to think that we were going to find, you know, some major toxic exposure that might be associated with Addisonian standard poodles, kind of interesting that what we found is that the biggest effect was actually kind of another human influence on the dog world, which is spaying or neutering your pets. So we animals that were neutered, male dogs that were neutered, were sixfold more likely to develop Addison's disease, and females that were spayed were two and a half fold more likely to develop Addison's disease. And this probably speaks to some interplay between the, gonad the gonads and the hormones that are produced and their influence on the adrenal glands and or their influence on the immune system that leads to the development of this disease. We kind of followed up this work by looking at how re how far before the development of Addison's disease were animals spayed and neutered. Um, and that's shown here in this figure on the right, where this red line represents the time at which a dog was spayed or neutered. And you can see the vast majority of dogs that developed Addison's disease did it within about 24 months of, of, become, of being spayed or neutered. And that potentially supports some kind of causal association. Obviously, more work needs to be done to kind of understand this better. Um, but we're sort of now thinking about spaying and neutering when we think about interactions in all of the genetic studies that we have ongoing. Um, and so beyond kind of the environmental uh, environmental effects and the genetic effects, kind of some other work that I'm doing is really focusing on trying to understand T cells in autoimmune diseases in dogs. We've heard a lot about, you know, other portions of the immune system and T cells from some of the other earlier talks. But one of the things that I've, I've kind of learned in trying to understand the role of, of cells in autoimmune disease is that there's actually really not much is really known about, or not nearly as much is known about the dog immune system as is known in mice and humans. And especially when you try to think about the specific T cells that trigger diseases, you know, our ability to sort of target these T cells is really poor. And so I'm working right now with some collaborators here at the University of Minnesota just to develop a, a vaccination model system where we can vaccinate dogs. We can look at their T cells within about seven to 14 days after they're vaccinated and use these this kind of technology, which was developed by one of my mentors, Mark Jenkins, um, MHC tetramers, which allow us to track dog T cells that are antigen specific for a particular disease to apply that to a rabies vaccination model system so that we can ultimately apply this same technology to the study of autoimmune diseases in dogs as has been done in humans and people, excuse me, humans and mice kind of extensively. So kind of that's really all I'm going to say about the research that I do, but I, I just kind of wanted to take this last slide and bring up a, a number of different challenges, I think, that I found in the study of all of these diseases um, and all in my research. And I think these echo a lot of things that have been brought up by other researchers. So the first thing I will say is I think there's, you know, limited funding out there for, for canine research. Um, I'm one of those people who's kind of gone to the NIH to try to be like, hey, you know, is this, this is a dog model of disease and it's a naturally occurring model and it occurs more frequently. So, you know, why not study this in dogs? 
And, you know, the jury's still out as to whether some of this stuff's going to, will, will, will be funded. But I think, you know, trying to be able to, there, there's just limited opportunities to do this kind of hard hitting research and dog foundations and donations are wonderful, but it's, it's, it's hard to sort of get the magnitude of the, the funding that the NIH can offer human and mice researchers to get that um, available for canine research. You know, I, I've also found that there is a little bit less coordination than I would like in the dog genetics world. And I think that's probably because there's less funding for a lot of these consortia. Like a good example of how this is sort of has manifested in the dog world is we now have maybe three or four different next generation reference genomes that we can map our data to, as opposed to kind of one genome that we can all map our data to and sort of talk transparently among labs. Well, different labs are mapping to different genomes and it makes kind of the study of dog genetics, I think, more difficult than it, it could be. Um, kind of from all of the, the research I've done in immunology, I will say that there's like a severe shortage of immunology tools, things like antibodies, sort of well-documented tests or well-documented uh, methodologies of developing, you know, understanding activated T cells, for example, in dogs versus people. And I think, again, that's partially due to a lack of funding in sort of um, doing some more basic immunology research in dogs um, versus other species. And then finally, you know, this, this kind of is, you know, part and parcel with some of the stuff that Dory was talking about ar around um, uh, the veterinary medicine and the way that care has developed. You know, many, most animal patients that are seen for specialty care are, are really probably not seen at universities anymore, but seen at a, a myriad of, of private practice specialty clinics around the country. And I think because care is so fragmented, it can make it really, really hard for researchers like me to collect research samples from busy clinicians who are kind of very focused on their day-to-day -day care. And I think that has also kind of presented challenges in letting samples go by that would otherwise um, you know, be precious to researchers like me. So um, that's really all I have to say. I just kind of want to acknowledge everyone in my lab and um, all the funding that I've received from the NIH and various foundations, the AKC, folks at the Poodle, Portuguese Water Dog, English Cocker Spaniel Club. Um, you know, and I especially like to thank my great collaborator, Leanne Clark at the University of Georgia, um, and my all of my mentors, um, in, in particular, my current mentors, Mark Jenkins and Chris Hogquist and Jaime Modiano, um, who really uh, helped a lot of this research move forward. And um, with that, I will take any questions you guys have. So thank you so much. Thank you, that was fantastic. Uh, I have a question for you here. Are canine GWAS reproducible and verifiable because of uh, um, uh, low diversity within dog breeds? Presumably this helps with identifying biomarkers of disease or not? Yeah, I mean, I, I think they're likely to be highly reproducible, like within a dog breed. But, you know, one of the things that we sort of very times off, often see is that, you know, con convergent evolution, you can have lots of different pathways leading to the exact same disease. So while, you know, X mutation may cause a particular disease in one breed, it could be a totally different gene or a different mutation in the same gene in a different breed. So, you know, it, I would not, it, it, just because you find something in one breed, I would think it's maybe unlikely to be exactly the same in another breed, particularly a highly unrelated breed. And um, you were mentioning, uh, actually all the panelists were mentioning challenges of, of funding. Um, is most of the investment in research in companion animals for companion animals supported by um, philanthropic and private sector organizations? Or um, do you do you justify it through the NIH as applicable to human disease? Or how do you, what's yeah, yeah. So that, that's a great question, right? So I, I think if you want to do research in the dog world for the benefit of dogs, you know, you you pretty much have to ask a breed club who may or may not have deep financial pockets. And then, or you're looking at organizations like the American Kennel Club, Canine Health Foundation, the Morris Animal Foundation. And so these are wonderful foundations or, or private donors, right? Who might have lots of resources to fund your research um, directly. If you want, but if you want to do research that's, I think at a, at a bigger scale with greater resources, you know, essentially a, a, a bigger purse to do your research with for more sustainable funding, you, you have to go to the NIH and, or, or like the, you know, the um, NSF, depending upon on the kind of research you do. And in almost all of those cases, you're sort of having to say, well, the dog is a model for X disease and here's why it's a good model. And then you're sort of up against someone who's like, well, 
I know that X disease in the mouse and I don't know about this dog model and sort of, you know, that's sort of the same problem that I think Dory was talking about earlier. You you wind up with reviewers who may or may not be familiar with, oh, that, you know, they didn't even know that dogs had an immune system or I'm sort of exaggerating, but, you know, there's, um, uh, it, it can become harder to sell, so. So I have, a, I have a question for you and then maybe the rest of the panelists as well, but let's start with you. In human medicine, there's more and more of a push towards personalized medicine. And some of the things that you mentioned are really relevant to personalized medicine, knowing the exact genetics of the of the dog that you're treating, for example. Um, where do you see the, the, the field going or where do you see the best application of resources pushing towards personalized medicine in companion animals or thinking more about something else, for example, um, breeding strategies? Yeah, so so I would sort of say, in, you know, in terms of personalized medicine, there's a couple of things that, that sort of make sense to me. So first I would sort of say the, the cost of sequencing a dog's genome or really the genome of any mammal, mammal has kind of plummeted precipitously. And, you know, we are now able to even in some cases offer a whole genome sequencing um, to patients that come in through the clinic if we think they have a particular disease that could be solved by understanding its, its genetic background. So that's one way in which personalized medicine may be helpful. Um, another kind of area where I think personalized medicine may be effective is in, um, in terms of like pharmacogenetics, in terms of understanding how drug metabolism might be altered by particular variants. There's a limited number of genes that are involved in that particular, um, in, in metabolizing drugs. And it might be possible for us to do things like develop a panel of kind of common variants. But the same, the problem we're gonna encounter in, do, in canine medicine is that variants are highly likely to be specific to a particular breed. So for example, let's say you find a variant in some cytochrome P450 gene and poodles that alters their metabolism of fentanyl, well, whether or not that, that same variant is going to be up applicable to a mixed breed dog or a German shepherd is really anyone's anyone's guess. And so, you know, um, that that's a, a little bit of a, a challenge that I think we face in the dog world is, is the, the nature of dog breeds. So. Thanks for that. Do any of the other panelists want to address that, that idea, that concept of personalized medicine versus other uses for the information that you are developing, knowledge that you're gaining? I think it's growing, certainly, certainly in the cancer field, but then also, um, you know, again, I, I think there's a, uh, a bit, uh, all of us have discussed, you know, a bit of the economics, the cost of treating animals, whether it's an infectious disease, uh, or cancer, or an autoimmune disease, which uh, I've spent most of my career studying diseases like lupus and type 1 diabetes, and I can appreciate uh, certainly the, the utility of Stephen's work uh, in a spontaneous model as opposed to more artificial mouse models, for example. Um, but, you know, the the I, I wish we could uh, lobby in a way the NIH for designating funds towards important diseases that I think are, as I mentioned earlier, vastly underappreciated in all of the things that the speakers today are, are talking about. You know, there's, for, <laughs> what's changed the landscape of of human immunology. Well, toll-like receptors, I think we've all heard of those. You know, they were first found in fruit flies and how, you know, bugs avoid infection as well as lower, you know, other species that now are critical for understanding human immune responses. So, uh, or immune responses to pathogens, for example. Um, and, there have been some home runs there, but, you know, again, it, I, I sit on NIH review study sections for lots of human diseases, and I'll bring it up when I find it appropriate is, you know, yeah, there's a good mouse model, but, you know, Steve at University of Minnesota can study this in, in a spontaneous, you know, setting and, <laughs> or, you know, or a mirror or other people, you know, studying various, you know, other diseases of 
companion animals. All right, thank you. We're we're going to go just a little bit over. Call on uh, Amir and and Dory. So Amir, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I I guess that I just wanted to maybe it's too late in the game, but you know we're all talking about NIH and how can we you know present naturally occurring diseases in order to get funding, be, uh, taking the one kind of one health approach, and I think that we're all on board with that. But to me, the thing that really kind of struck me is that we all know, I mean, I think Mark was the one mentioning the, those numbers, like we have tens of millions of dogs in the US, we know how much those owners appreciate those dogs, right? We know how much money they put into taking care. I, we see that in our clinics every day. There is no question about the, you know, the societal significance of canine and feline health. Nonetheless, in spite of the fact that it has a huge societal impact, there is no federal money that goes into directly into, you know, companion animal research. And I feel like we accept that as a dogma, but I don't understand why. Why do we have to go to NIH? Why can't there be a federal agency that will fund research, veterinary research? Thank you, Amir. And um, Dory, if you can keep it short, that would be great. Sorry. Yeah, no, I'll keep it really short, which is that the success that I've seen for most of us who have had funding from the NIH for these spontaneous models have been in specific RFPs where they have special emphasis panels and study sections that are different than the routine study sections that work for um, the NIH. That seems to be the best way to get the diversity of people on the panel that can really speak to the value of spontaneous uh, animal models. And I don't disagree with you, Amir. I, I also recognize that the biggest funding right now that's for human animal bond and human animal wellness. There is some funding available for that, which you know arguably is very different than disease, but that's right now where the federal monies are. Well, I wanna thank all of you for this fascinating session. And uh, we're just gonna turn to uh, Kavita to close. Mm -hmm. Thank you all of you for joining today. Um, we hope that you um, got something interesting out of this discussion and a lot of sort of forward-looking, thought-provoking things to look forward to. Um, we would like for you, uh, after the session ends, to complete the survey, post-event survey, which um, should be in the chat right now. Uh, please feel free to do so. That will help us sort of keep aware of some of the issues that you would like to hear us address in the future and also to hear um, you know, your kind of responses and feedback to today's uh, webinar. So we look forward to engaging with all of you in the future. And thanks again to all of our speakers for such an enlightening and interesting discussions. Take care. <laughs>